Hello. Uh, hi there. Oh no. Can't I can't take you off mute. Um, good evening from my end. It, it's it's almost 12 a.m. here in Wuhan, China. Um, I'm sure it's around 2.33 there about in the UK and Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, it will be around, is it one o'clock? No, yeah, one o'clock in my country, Ghana. Yeah, so um, greetings to everybody. Um, we've discussed this paper, I think extensively on the platform, but I think Dr. Duarte thinks that there's still a need for me to do an oral presentation, more or less like a summary of what we discussed and any other technical questions left hanging, I could address them. And so um, sorry for coming too late, my schedule has been very tight here. Um, this paper was published based on a project that was sponsored by the Mill and Berenda Gate Foundation to the plant production system to Wadena University and implemented by the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture um, through its various partners across Sub-Saharan Africa. The project was implemented in 11 countries and the main aim of the project was to exploit the natural phenomenon called nitrogen fixation through a symbiotic association with biological um, rhizobial, that is a bacteria that inhabit the root zones of most leguminous plants to be able to um, uh, improve soil fertility for maximum yield returns on most legume crops, especially in non-responsive soil zones, such as in the savanna areas in Nigeria, in Ghana, and Uganda, in Zimbabwe, and other African countries that the project was implemented. The project officially ended last year in September. Um, so this is one of the papers that was published in Agronomy Journal that was last year. I happened to work on the project as a research associate and a data manager. Um, so my presentation is going to take this format. Um, I will briefly look at the introduction, just a summary of it. There are several slides, but I'll just look at one or two slides as we have already discussed extensively in this paper. And I'll touch more on the materials and method, which I think is key and where most of us would like to see some things that they could replicate or incorporate in the existing research or upcoming research. And I also highlight on key findings that is key results from the research. I'll conclude and be able to define the way forward, give a status quo of aftermath of the project, the impact so far after the project has officially ended. So I will look at a study background. Um, legumes, that is green legumes. Um, here our attention was on three main legumes, cowpea, granite, and soya bean. Um, happens to be one of the major um, indigenous legume crops in household food and income security, especially in Northern Ghana, where majority of our population live below $1 a day. Um, the plant is usually, these plants are usually grown by smallholder farming, and you see them on cluster of smallholder farming systems across these Guinea Savanna agroecological zones. Soya bean happens to be one of the flagship crops that was selected by the recent Ghana Metasip project. The Metasip project stands for the Ghana Medium Term Agricultural Subsector Investment Program, which is a key strategic um, um, program implemented by subsequent government. But this, gov this current regime has also lifted this project up into another program that they are implementing currently. And so soya bean at, um, was a very key component of this project because of its economic um, uses. Um, apart from the direct nutritional potentials that is sourced from these, these leguminous crops, it also have the potential to increase the income 
of most rural dwellers, especially in the savanna areas. In 2014, the USAID estimated that Ghana as a country needed 180,000 180, tons of cooking oil, seasoning, and for animal feed, which most of the time is sourced from these three legumes, and which um, exceed the current demand of 140,000 tons per hectare. And this led the country to import large quantity of soya bean oil and soya meal throughout the year. And this continues even up to now. Uh, about 2,500 tons of soya bean grain and other soya bean products were imported in 2015 alone. That's according to Ministry of Trade and Industries. I'll skip most of these because um, we've already discussed this. So I will look at the key part. The main production challenges, um, I think let me find a way to mute this. They are cloudy, my sorry. Okay. The main production challenge of this legume production across the savanna zones are low and variable yields that is obtained from the existing variety that the farmers are used to. And in the northern region, it's a unimodal climate pattern. In other words, they have only one raining season throughout the year. And sometimes some of this, uh, uh, this raining season lasts for only three months. So you can imagine a whole year, if it rains for only three months, you can imagine the life of the people. And their main source of livelihood is farming. And this farming um, basically is into this green legumes production and minor vegetable production that they use as a source of feed and a source of income for their rural households. So yeah, yield in Northern Ghana was estimated by the Savannah Agricultural Research Institute in 2005 to increase to 2.5 tons per hectare. So out of these, um, we realized that a lot of research that were done attributed these to low yielding varieties and limited use of inputs such as phosphorus-based fertilizers, rhizobium inoculant, which was not even heard of until the project was implemented, and most of the seeds that were even imported as introduction were not certified seeds. And when farmers plant them, they make economic losses. And so most of them get discouraged of going for these improved seeds. But then there was this particular research that um, my colleagues did in 2006 um, that estimated that when farmers are able to apply rhizobium inoculant and phosphorus fertilizer, they are able to increase their yield from 452 to 447 kilograms per hectare. And so this underpinned our concentration on these three crops, even though there were other crops that the project focused on. But we decided to highlight these crops as part of the project. So we deliberately concentrated on this to carry it out as a research with the farming communities. So the objective was to evaluate the response of these green legumes, that is cowpea, soya bean, and granite, um, to fertilizer, that is a pea fertilizer, phosphorus-based fertilizer application, and to assess the economic viability to guide the farmers in these three regions, in the upper west, upper east, and the northern region, for their adoption with the, the additional technologies that was being implemented by the project. In as much as the technology was being demonstrated to the farmers, they didn't have the confidence to, to, to wholeheartedly accept them or to um, employ them in their farming practices. And so what IITA does, the IITA is a research institute that does not have a research farm. Our research farms are the farmers' farms. And so we work with smallholder smallholder farmers. And so their research farms are basically our research, their farms are basically our research farms. And so what we do is that we work with farmer groups and also work with farming communities, also work with relief agencies, also work with other farmer-based organizations that reach out to farmers in their operations. And so this basically was what we did. And so what the project seeked to do was to link input suppliers, aggregators, farmer-based organization, and processes to soya bean, especially soya bean, in the three northern regions. And by then, by the time we finished, we had increased yield for 140,000 tons to 200,000 tons per annum. 
materials and method. I'll concentrate more here. The project main approach was to use a value chain approach to form a strategic partnership with major actors. Um, and this was done because we realized that these three legumes, it is not only about the production. The production was just an aspect. After the production, what happens along the value chain is very key for the farmer's economic sustainability. And so right from harvesting, right from the transports to, to the processing, that is to the aggregators, it must be managed well. And so what we did was to bring all the actors along the value chain and form a strategic partnership with them. And so by the time we ended, we had, we had over 200 I mean, partners are along the value chain. We have people who were into the seed production. We have companies that were into the into machine. I mean, providing tractor services, providing plows, providing harrows, providing combined harvesters for these farmers at a fee. Um, we also look at the post-harvest handling, how farmers are able to handle the produce. We also look at the market, how farmers are able because they don't have storage facilities. And so what we sought to do was also collaborate with the other project that was being implemented by the USAID with its partners, who were also establishing community warehouses. And so these community warehouses kind of aggregate these produce from the various farms and at a guaranteed price for these farmers so that the farmers are not cheated along the line. Then we also link up with those who translate this produce into finished product, I'm talking about the processes, who process them into various, into soya meal, into cakes, into various other I mean, products that um, are in demand across the country and across the region. And so what we, we the, main, the major approach of this project was to develop the value chain for the soya bean and other legume crops value, um, uh, uh, value chain. Um, and so we, we, we did a lot of what we call dissemination campaigns, um, in, especially in 2015, since we were wrapping up the project. And so we had to intensify our dissemination campaign. The dissemination campaigns where we had texted the technologies, we had texted the input, we had texted the improved varieties, we had texted all the agronomic practices that we have promoted and demonstrated to these farmers. And so those that were picked, those that were selected by the farmers based on the actual result that they saw on their field, we had to really emphasize that to the farmers. And what we did in 2015 and 2016 was to re-demonstrate this to them, how they'll be able to manage these technologies that they adopted so that even when the project exit with minimal input or minimal investment from their own pocket, you'll be able to gain ma maximum output. And so two main, two main technology that we highlighted was the application of rhizobium inoculant and phosphorus-based fertilizer. We did this because um, from several literature, it's, ex it's, it's, it's found that um, in as much as all other factors are, are, are favorable, without certain major micronutrients such as phosphorus, nitrogen alone cannot improve the yield of these three legumes, especially most legume crops. Not only this, not limited to only these three legumes, but all legumes. When nitrogen is fixed, nitrogen need to work in symbiotic relationship with these other micro micronutrients to be able to improve yield for the farmers. And so what we, we did was to bring along the value chain input supplier the way into fertilizer supply and so one of our one of our major suppliers was uh, yara ghana yara happens to be one of the largest producers of fertilizers phosphorus based fertilizer actually they they usually deal with nitrogen fertilizers but through the project their interest was was kindled and they took they took it up and they, they came on as as, as major partners and so apart from um, they were the wholesalers and so when they produce these fertilizer they mix them locally they also have what they call the outlets and so the outlet are the locally based agrochemical shops and so what we did was to put them into groups and also offer them 
training so that they will take this as a business, not as, I mean, the, the usual way of doing things so that everybody will be serious with it. And what we did was also link them to our farmer based organization, link them to the extension offices, link them to the, the farming community association that we're working with. And so they can have a direct channel to be able to have this, in, uh, this input at all times um, at, at a reasonable price for the farmers to be able to afford. And so basically, this was the approach the project used on farm demonstrations. And so in 2015 and 2016, eight districts were, 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 were selected. There were several districts that participated in the campaign. Uh, these were the, the districts that we focused our attention. One, because they had um, what they call um, non-responsive soil issues was higher compared to the other regions. What I mean by non-responsive soil was that there were some soils that the scientists were calling dead soils. In other words, this soil has depleted, were depleted of phosphorus completely. And so even though when nitrogen is fixed and is replenished, the nitrogen is not able to, I mean, to boost the growth of this plant. And so they need other additional nutrients to be able to revive this soil so that it can support the growth of plant, of this plant. And so our attention was based on the previous research, was focused on these eight regions that had such serious issues that was reported in our past research. And so in the northern region, we are three districts. In the upper east region, we are three districts. And in the upper west region, we are two districts. And so um, we, as I said, I've explained this, we selected them based on these with the consultation with the local partners. Uh, especially this religious uh, relief organization that lives in the community with them no more than we do. So we did this in consultation with them and we went ahead to have our focus on this district. In 2016, it was the same thing that was done. But then the only, the only difference was that there were no dissemination campaign that was undertaken on Calpi in 2016 because most of the farmers think that a cow pee was becoming um, too much for them. In other words, there were a lot of cow pee in the system from the past year's production. And so the farmers didn't have the confidence to go into looking at the sale and the marketability. So we thought it wise to take it out and concentrate on soya bean and granules. <laughs> Managing of the demonstration, as I responded to, I think one of the comments on the platform was basically done by the farmers. And this was done by the organized groups, mostly into 15 to 30 farmers, and with a lead farmer that was trained directly by the project. And what this seeks to do was for this lead farmer to also set, serve as, as, as a focal point for other farmers, which we refer to as the site light farmers. And this farmer also gives regular training to his colleague farmers, which the project also have what we call them field using officers in, in attendance to supervise and also provide technical backstopping to these farmer-based farmers training. Um, the crops that were texted were cowpea, as I said, peanut and soya bean. And these were the practices that our attention focused on. The farmer's practice here refers to um, no phosphorus-based fertilizer application. And these were planted by the farmers on their field, on the same field, but this field were partitioned. And so the control was also, also had no uh, phosphorus-based fertilizer. And these were planted by the researcher with the farmers. And the last one, which is the um, cow pea, which uh, phosphorus based fertilizer planted by the farmer and the researcher. In other words, the researcher led the, the, the farmers to plant so that we don't bias our own experiment. The next one had to do with the pea, not the same, the same treatment were, were, were tested. So yeah, being, um, the only difference was that this time around we're adding phosphorus based fertilizer and inoculant, and which was absent in the other ones. And so these were the, the name of the treatment we used. 
IITA through the projects was able to develop it on um, local um, inoculant, which we call the Nodomas, which contain Brady Rhizobium japonicum with a USDA 110 string at, at a rate of seven, kilo, seven grams per kilogram of seeds. And so before these were applied, we trained the farmers. I mostly did most of this training. We we'll go and with a farmers group, they organize themselves and we train them how to apply the inoculant to the seeds before they sow them. And the P was applied as triple superphosphate, as I explained earlier. The experimental layout was um, was in a randomized complete block design. And what we did was each each demonstration in this district represent a replicate. And the plot sizes were mostly 10 to 12 meters with a planting distance of 60 by 20, 60 by 20, and 60 by 10, and two he's per, uh, two C's per all for cowpea, peanut, and the soya bean respectively. Um, because we trusted, because we did the cleaning of the seed, we supplied them the seeds. These seeds were certified seeds. And so there was no need for them to plant beyond two seeds because we had tested the germination potential of these seeds and we are sure of it that yet it will be able to germinate at a time. And so there was no need for them to waste more seeds planting three or four seeds. And so strictly they went by the recommendation of two seeds per hill. And I must say that. Yes, most of these seeds were germinated at the time because we're working within the plant time and ensure that all the recommended agronomic practices were, were adopted by the farmers with their researchers. And these were our key results. I, I'm not going to present most of the statistics because I think Felix has talked extensively on this. So, but before I conclude, I'll respond specifically to some of the concerns he raised with certain aspects of the statistics. And so let me highlight major, the major um, findings from this research. The pea fertilizer application um, from our research, that is for the two years, increased yield by 297, uh, 296, 527, and 390 kilograms per hectare. That is for the cowpea, peanut, and soya bean greens in the upper, up in the northern region, upper east and the upper west regions. Uh, the pea fertilizer also increased. Um, yes, so what we did, this was the total. And so what we did per kilogram of pea fertilizer applied, how much increment was recorded for each of these three, three green legumes. And so this was what we recorded, 9.85. Three, uh, one three zero zero and one seven point five six per kilogram per hectare of kilogram of pea applied for cow pea, soya bean, and pea. In other words, what it means is that when you apply one kilogram of phosphorus bead fertilizer, in addition to practicing all the agronomic practices that we recommended and demonstrated to the farmers, they are expected to gain an average of these of yield increase in their production. And um, Based on these, we concluded that the applications were cost effective. P application, um, we realized that um, uh, will contribute to productivity of green legumes with a high cost benefit ratio. Um, in one of the tables that we estimated the cost benefit ratio, that is looking at the investment they made in purchasing these P fertilizer and the inoculant and the cost incurred in the labor they hired in applying them and the cost they even incurred in managing the farm. When they take that all, the net income that will be able to have at hand. And so we represent that by the cost benefit ratio in the, one of the tables that we, we, we represented in the paper. The responses to P, um, yes, this was one of the interesting findings that we came that we, we, we came to, to, to record. Um, we realized that um, in as much as PEEF application with the inoculant application was very effective across the three regions, 
it was however not not effective across board in other words um, the effect were location specific especially in the upper east region for instance um, um, maybe um, i'll come there in the upper east region um, even though p application was applied using the same rate when you look at the yield coming from the upper east region compared to the northern region and the upper west region it was comparatively low the same thing when you compare the northern region to the upper east it, the northern region recorded higher yield compared to the upper east region the same when you compare the upper upper west region to the upper east region in terms of yield recorded from these applications the upper east region was comparatively higher than the, the upper west region was comparatively higher than the upper west region and so we concluded that the location, and this happened in 2015 and 2016, and so more or less like they confirmed over the two years that the, the application could be location specific. And so might not be advisable for farmers, especially in the Upper East region, to invest all their money in, in the pea fertilizers or the inoculant for, for, their, for their production activities. And so, um, we concluded that planting more adaptable improved green legal varieties that the project recommended and some that were locally developed with the Savannah Agriculture Research Institute of the CSIR and using this uh, Nodimus inoculum and other inoculum that were recommended, farmers will be able to make viable economic gains and be able to reduce their risk for increasing their yield from growing these three legumes across the northern region. I Okay, these were just infographic trying to represent what the conclusion that I drew. And the last one, let me highlight it. And so what we, we recommended to is in as much as the farmers were interested, what we saw was that these assets Recruited from buying them. And so I think I have one task to do. I think I have one task to do. Um, Felix was 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 asking a question. I think I'm with the ANOVA. Yes. His concern was that um, why didn't you use two-way ANOVA? Yes, we used two-way ANOVA. Um, but maybe we, we were a bit silent on that. It was a two-way ANOVA because the factors we, we evaluated were more than two. And so definitely it's two-way ANOVA that is applicable for such, such an experiment. Um, and I think one of the questions he also posed was, why did we use LSD instead of using 2 kit HSD? In agronomic practices, data presentations are different from other, other disciplines of research. Um, I say this because we are looking at a treatment because you can apply four or five treatment at the end of the day, what the farmer needs is which one gives the best result. All of them may be giving good results, but the farmer is interested in one or two that give the most promising results. And so what we do is that we don't focus so much on the statistics in terms of coming out with the arrow, they are becoming out with the statistical levels, but then even when you come out the statistical, we want to see how does that reflect on the specific treatment that we evaluated. And so we, we, we rather present the, the, the treatment values, I mean the values for the individual treatment, and use the statistics to explain their differences. And so that's what we represented. I don't know if I have, I may not be able to use the exact statistical terms to explain because I'm not a statistician. 
but this is what we do in agronomic research. And so we don't concentrate so much on the hardcore statistics, but we look at the, the story that the statistics is telling. How is that impacting the individual treatment that we evaluated? Because that is what the farmer is interested in. That is what the, 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 the founder will be interested in to promote. I mean, the sponsor of the project will be interested to promote. I don't know if that, um, that response may be clearer to him. Um, I think there was another question that was asked by him with the, was it with a table? One of the table, yes. Um, the owl was defined. We actually defined them as a legend below, but the general recommended that since we mentioned those key treatment that were representing the table as part of the title of the tables, Let's capture them and abbreviate them there so that it doesn't bore the reader. And so when you saw into bracket, you see that treatment we put into bracket T about the table, about the table. Um, where you see um, R, region, region was put into bracket R, but I think um, you must be very keen that you won't see it because you must draw over and straight away jump to the table. And so those were captured but I think maybe not in the usual way that we are all used to as, as students of statistics. And so I'll bring my presentation to an end here. I don't want to delve too much about the statistics because Travelis did a great job by explaining the details of it. So Andy, I'll end here. Thank you very much. And I think we switched the WhatsApp platform. Any other question that comes, I'll be ready to respond to them. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Kojo. Um, so unless anybody has any really quick questions now, um, we will stop um, now and pass over to the WhatsApp platform for any other questions. And I'll also send the recording of this video to, to WhatsApp so people can watch again. Um, unless anybody here has any quick questions now. Ah, Felix, you're there. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I, I would I would put up my question on on WhatsApp. Okay. Okay. Uh, please. Okay. My, this this mic is not so sharp. I'm, I'm not on that. Uh, but I can hear you. I can hear you clearly. Actually. You be, okay. Yeah. You can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. All right. So let let me just ask a quick one. You know the the data across you know what what we usually do is if you're looking at the statistical significance different across okay at the, at the end of the table we we have a way of putting the test of significance and the p value there but instead i saw a mean at the end okay and and, and, and these variables are you know you have three different treatments you okay. have the farmer, the control, and the P. And the, the three of them are three different groups. Okay. So having a, a mean of the three of them at the end, you know, of what I don't know, of what Okay, uh, let me let me let me respond to that quickly. Let me respond to that quickly. The research was conducted in the Savannah Agroecological Ecological Zone. And because of their peculiar chromatic pattern and soil. Uh, soil fertility status and so that was why this research was done and so whatever extrapolation we get from the data was to apply to the savannah average ecological zone not across ghana and so after we've done for the individual regions the upper east upper west and the northern regions yes. what the project wanted us to um what i the stats the statistician wanted us the story the question he asked is that so how is that for each of the regions. I mean, how is that for, let's say, the northern region? What was the yield per P application across the region? What was the average yield for that whole region? What was the average yield for Upper East? What was the average yield for Upper West? What was the average yield for northern region? And what was their statistical significant levels? I don't know if I, ans if I answered your question. Okay, it's, okay. Okay, yes. 
Yes. Um, okay. That uh, that that makes a whole lot of sense. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, it makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, but but the interest of the paper was was the comparison. Yes, the comparisons. Yes. You know. So I I guess probably if if we have that one, which is like an addition to okay. see everything holistically as one. One, so, yes. Yes, so we would still have had the comparison stand out on its own, then the holistic precisely standing out on, on its own, yeah. So precisely, because, yes, because it, it's not so clear the way they are all modeled up in one. Okay, so um let me I think there was part um the last slide I didn't show um the conclusion and the way forward. Based on this, based on this, when this new regime came, this um, current government came, they implemented a program called the Planting for Food and Jobs. And what they were looking at was not the individual values of the various locations, specific locations we worked on. They needed the data for all these regions. Upper East, when we apply this, okay. what was it per kilogram? And so based on that, we were able to push another project to them based on this as, as a sustainable way of uh, um, I mean, expanding the impact of the project. And so they took it up. And so it is part of the Planting for Food and Jobs program now, where they are implementing this program to expand the legume, legume improvement program using this technology that we demonstrated and tested for the five years through the project lifespan. And so one of the ways they are trying is to, um, through an outgrower contractual arrangement in which my boss was directly involved to be able to implement it through where the individual farmers were going to serve as Lucros production unit. And the second one they, were, they, they adopted was a contractual scheme with produce, produce buyers. I mean, can I respond? Can I talk? Is there any, can market. anyone hear me? And so they are yes, able to I buy can. and send this to them. And this was the data that, I mean, they were interested in. And so that was what informed us to be able to aggregate this data and get the average. Yes, yes. Okay, I see. Right. Okay. Uh, it's clear now. Yeah. I want to make. Uh, Doctor. Yes, I can see you. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so actually, actually, I have a question with respect to a follow up with what uh, Mr. Felix said. Okay. That particular, that particular table where you took the mean of different tests across and uh what's it called that along the colon and then down the row no down the okay. row uh, across the colon okay okay i have a concern with that actually which i don't want to whatsapp i would like to ask you it one on one okay okay my concern about that aspect was because if you if you had done the presentation like in my person like okay like if i'm if i'm if i'm here with you i like to argue okay and <laughs> When it when it comes to that, I would really argue with you. But this time, my question is: for me, I feel there's going to be there's going to be um, having to sum up all the data from different treatments, and then from different farmers, and then having the overall for you to do a statistical comparison. For me, I would prefer that I see a data with respect to the individual treatment and the individual farm, as in the individual persons who took those experiments and got their data, I would have preferred that the average of those ones are being compared instead of across the whole thing being added together, just like Mr. Felix said, okay? So having everything summed together, because you may have a low response in one from one person and have a high response in one person, and then where you're supposed to even see a significance, you will not be able to see it again because now you're having a wider SD or SE as a result of having information from, you know, whether different population information from different uh, treatment or from different persons. So for me, I would suggest that, okay, if there's any review that will come up later on that same paper, then the individual statistical significance for those individual treatment, not across the entire treatment, taking as one, because that really concerned me, 
in person. So I, I know you give a reason why you did it that way, but from a statistical standpoint, you may be shutting yourself because some information may come out of the individual treatment that you may not see or because you have now summed everything up and given an aggregate value at the extreme. Because I noticed on that table, you gave the average at the base and you gave the average on the side and you compare those ones alone. Meanwhile, the within group, what happens to them? Because the within group can give you even more information with respect to what the whole data is even talking about. So that's just my own you know, summary with respect to that. Because if you do it individually within, then you may have more information again or additional information that the aggregate did not even give you. Because you might have said, the aggregate might have showed that there is no significance, but by the time you check in, in between the within, then you may see a significance and be able to tell that, okay, say for example, I decide to run a principal component analysis, assuming you have a large data. Yeah. It may be only one factor that is contributing to the significance of the whole thing. Not by just because by the time you have summed the whole thing up or taking the average of the whole thing, you will not be able to tell which main factor amidst the individual treatment. Can, probably I, can, I, can I clarify that? Because, um, from your presentation, your argument, you've already answered the question, you raised the issue and you answered it. You answered it. You, the issue was your concern was that when we do that, we might do that at the expense of the within group's comparison, yeah. right? That yeah. was your concern. Yeah. But when you yeah. look at the table carefully, when you look at the table carefully, the, in the, the within group comparison was done before the group average was done. So all of them were taken care of. Uh, it had to do okay. with the, the matter of interest of the, uh, of the various okay. audiences. I remember okay. the effects table, for instance, I omitted the group, uh, the group name. And when I sent it, two of the reviewers wrote back to me and said, no, they want me to do it like the way I did it for table two and table three, because in as much as they are interested in the, the specific location variances, they are also interested in the regional variances, because as an invest, for you to cut an investment, for you to gotcha. cut, the investor is not going to look at small communities, it's going to look at the whole region. Okay, that is gotcha. what they are talking about. And so, okay, so interest, the, interest matters. Yes, interest. So the intrinsic comparison was done. Um, I mean, sorry to use that. I think it's not a, like the internal comparison was done for the various okay. locations. And gotcha the group gotcha. comparison was done for the regions. Okay. Because this is a commercial project. And for you to be able to get other funding, you need to present a good business case. The okay. individual community variance cannot make any good business for an investor to put his or her money there. Okay. I don't know if I you understand. You. I yeah, I got yeah. you. I like the response you gave when you were responding on WhatsApp by, by starting with the fact that this is not, you made a, a particular clause which says that this is not academic research. And that, <laughs> that gave answer to so many things. This is like a policy making kind of study, yeah. which exactly. I really, I like that yeah. response. When I saw that response, I, all the argument that is in my head, I kind of zeroed it because <laughs> I felt okay, you have answered everything from that standpoint. Thank sorry, you. sorry, sorry if I was harsh with that comment. <laughs> no, 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 no. Since you no, said it's no. not academic, then I'm good. So, um, so with the current project that I'm talking about, this government has taken it up and they now have two, two investors on board. The USAID is also scaling up this. Fal um, uh, Yara is also taking this project up based on those. And they are now looking at the individual community comparison. What we use in that proposal, if you have time, maybe we could chat privately. I'll share that proposal with you. We're using the group comparison. And that was what convinced them that no, this, this could make a good business case. And they have two, two, two investors on board that are taking that up to scale up the impact of the project. I got you. Thank you. Thank you too. Yeah, about the, about the what's it called now? The technical aspect, that, that response again kind of, zeroed my mind with respect to the fact that it's not academic because if it's academic from the academic standpoint i'll be looking at why is it that that uh <clears throat> the inoculum you have okay so you sent me a message you said you have it in your which i read in the article as well in terms of the technical response or, or the mm. relationship or the symbiotic effect of having okay. the two marrying the two together in terms of the phosphate that's the chemical and the biological stuff having them married together and how this okay. is playing in role in terms of plant response. Okay, so if 
for me, from the standpoint of an academic, I wasn't really like completely fully satisfied with the with the with the description that you gave, uh, which you sent to me or which you sent to WhatsApp, which is also already in the article as well. I provided uh, citations, like three different citations. Yeah. So you could even look at. <laughs> okay, which I know. Okay, I understand that you provided the citations to some of those things, but I was yeah. expecting that as it's an academic work, I would okay. say okay, you, you know, you can you can really go deeper with respect to even the citations you gave and some of the responses you gave to it. Me, I was thinking of, okay, plants with respect to phosphorus, how does it, what is the role in terms of cell, because I'm taking it so deep into cell division, you know, receptors and how they take up receptors for phosphorus and how phosphorus is being incorporated in the cell Good. and then being Good. taken into it and then formation of DNA and then cell division comes from there and all those. Okay. I'm just looking at it from that technical standpoint of okay. how phosphorus then becomes a part of the cell division that makes the plant to eventually grow. And then what is now the role of the inoculum, the biological response or the biological factor that aids whether, is it going to be, aid, so I'm, I'm looking at it that, is it going to be aiding the receptors from, you know, of the, the plant inoculant, cell? The inoculant only, only boosts atmospheric nitrogen freezation. Okay. Nitrogen, so through that symbiotic relationship, there's nitrogen that is fixed directly from the atmosphere. Okay, so that's that we just don't apply, We don't apply nitrogen-based fertilizer, aka the NPK, the ammonium, perphosphate, and stuff like that. We don't apply those things, which have a lot of detrimental effect on the environment. And so we source nitrogen using the inoculant from the atmosphere, from nature. I mean, naturally, using the inoculant okay. to boost that process. Then, okay. remember that plants need a combination of both micro and macronutrient. It is not only yeah. nitrogen. A plant okay. without, without adequate phosphorus supply, I'm sorry, there will be problem with green formation. Yeah. There will be problem yeah. with cell division, as you said. There will be problem with yeah. cell enlargement or expansion. There will yeah. be problem with, in terms of, I mean, um, an, an uptake of other nutrients, such as um, potassium, for instance, one of the research we published last year was that where there was low uptake of phosphorus, where okay. there was low uptake of phosphorus, nitrogen also surfaced the same thing. So what we realized was that nit um, aluminum, sorry, aluminum needed phosphorus in certain amount to be able okay. to perform, to be able for the plant to be able to form fruit or form grains. And so we need okay. this combination of both micro and micronutrient for the plant to be able to give us the better harvest that we need. Okay, and then I, I would make this. I will make a suggestion that you should also give. Uh, I don't know if you have tried it before, but you should also give AMF, Abuscular Mycorrhizae Fungi. You should also give it a, a, a try because I've done a study with respect to uh, bioenergy crop growth, and then I use co fly ash. Co fly ash, you know, in the US, co fly ash is not. It's, it's a pollutant, you know, and it's yeah. a co combustion waste. But my yeah. professor was trying to see how. We can use this coal fly ash to like cultivate because in, com in in some developing countries and even some countries like uh, uh, India, they have been using coal fly ash also as a source of, you know, as soil amendment for plant growth. But in the US, you can't use it for any food crop growth because of the heavy metals that are present in it. Then we then we thought of the fact that we have a biological mechanism that we can also incorporate with respect to the coal fly ash that will prevent the toxicity of the coal fly ash and then still aid the nutrient uptake that is, you know, for the plants to, to really grow. So I would suggest one way or the other, if you have not done anything with incorporating uh, abuscular mycorrhiza fungi as, you know, also a, as a composition or as a combination with the inoculum that you have already, then you should also give it a shot. And I think it's also very beneficial with respect to plant growth that may be stressed by I nutrient. Think, I think I think that that work has been was taken up by a PhD student from Nigeria at the Wageningen University. I think it's published, and the PhD should be published on the website. I'll check and get back to you. Oh, okay. Somebody, I, I remember somebody somebody whose uh, PhD was was on this on this same thing you are, you are mentioning as part of one of the annual annual workshops that we had for the project. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you too, bro. Okay, I'm going to have to uh, to stop um, the video yeah. now, even though I think okay. a couple of people have just joined. <laughs> um, but we'll... <laughs>
Um, I'll, I'll mute everyone. We'll, we'll record the video and um, I'll okay. post it to the WhatsApp group and you can um, continue discussion on there now if you like. But thank, thank you very much, uh, Kojia, thank for the presentation and for the great follow-up questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.